Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. I should say first that because I have the title Astronomer Royal, I'm often asked, do you do the Queen's horoscopes? And I have to say, well, if she wanted one, I'm the man she'd ask. But she hasn't asked. And of course, I am an astronomer, not an astrologer. And I should say at the start that scientists are rotten forecasters, though not quite as bad as economists. <laughs> and I've nonetheless written a book rather pretentiously called On the Future. But I should say at the start that my forecasts, which be mainly about the next century, but I will talk about things billions of years in the future at the end of the lecture, these forecasts will be very tentative. But the theme of my book is this. The Earth existed for 45 million centuries. But this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has the planet's future in its hands. We're deep in the Anthropocene, where we could irreversibly degrade the biosphere, or we could trigger the transition from biological to electronic evolution, or misdirected technology could cause a catastrophic setback to our civilization. But let's focus first on two things we can predict even with a rather crowdy crystal ball. First, the world will be more crowded. And secondly, the world will be warmer. But what about population trends first? 50 years ago, the world's population was about 3.5 billion. It's now about 7.7 .7 billion. The growth has been mainly in Asia and in Africa, as is shown in this distorted map, which gives each country an area proportional to the population growth in the last 25 years. But the number of births per year worldwide actually peaked a few years ago and is now going down in most countries. Nonetheless, the world's population is forecast to rise to about 9 billion by 2050. That's partly because most people in the developing world are young, they're yet to have children, and they will live longer. So the age histogram, which in a developing world is like the one on the left, lots of young people, not many old people, will become rather like the one on the right for Western Europe. The young people will grow old uh, and not die off so soon. Well, despite doom-laden forecasts in the 1960s, food production has actually kept pace with the doubling of the population since then. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not to overall scarcity. But to feed the nine billion people who'll be around by mid-century is going to require further improved agriculture, low-till, water conserving, and GM crops. And also, dietary innovations. We can't all live like present-day wealthy Americans and Europeans, eating as much beef, for instance. We may have to convert insects, highly nutritious and rich in protein, into palatable food, and make artificial meat. And that's a really benign technology to advance that. To quote Gandhi, there'll be enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Projections beyond 2050 are uncertain. It's not even clear whether there'll be a continuing rise or a fall. Falling infant mortality, urbanization and women's education triggered the demographic transition towards lower birth rates. But there could be countervailing cultural influences. If, for whatever reason, families in Africa remain large, then according to the UN, that continent's population could double again between 2050 and 2100 to 4 billion. 
thereby raising world population to 11 billion. And Nigeria alone would then have as big a population as Europe and North America combined, about 900 million. Well, optimists say that each extra mouth brings two hands and a brain. But it's the geopolitical stresses that are most worrying. As compared to the fatalism of earlier generations, those in poor countries now know, by the internet, etc., what they're missing. And migration's easier. That's a portent for disaffection and instability. Multiple mega versions of the tragic boat people crossing the Mediterranean today. And incidentally, poor countries now can't leapfrog their economies in the way that the Asian tigers, Taiwan and Korea, did by undercutting manufacturing costs. Which robots can now do cheap manufacturing. That ladder's been kicked away. So wealthy nations, especially those in Europe, should urgently promote growing prosperity in Africa, and not just for altruistic reasons. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact on land use and climate pushes too hard, then the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We're destroying the book of life before we've read it. Already there's more biomass in chickens and turkeys than in all the world's wild birds. And the biomass in humans, cows and domestic animals is 20 times that in wild mammals. Preserving biodiversity is crucial to human well-being. But for many environmentalists, preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, quite apart from what it means to us humans. And to quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So the world's getting more crowded. And as a second firm prediction, it'll gradually get warmer. In contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under-discussed, though it is sadly still rather under-responded to. The famous Keeling curve, measurements made in Hawaii, show how the carbon dioxide concentration has risen over the last 50 years. The oscillation, incidentally, is because there are more trees in the northern hemisphere than the south, so in the northern autumn, leaves die, CO2 goes up, and it's taken up again in the spring. But the important point is the very uh, drastic trend over the last 50 years. And the fifth IPCC report presented a spread of projections about how CO2 as a, global, as a greenhouse gas would lead to a warming temperature. And here are four graphs they produced to, which make different assumptions about future use of fossil fuels, whether it stay, stays the same, goes up or goes down. Incidentally, there's still some uncertainty in the modeling because although we know what CO2 itself does, we don't know how changes in the temperature will affect water vapor, cloud cover, and things like that. So the bars on the right indicate the uncertainty in the projections because of the uncertain uh, uh, science and modeling. And of course, the IPCC fifth report was some years ago, but the need for urgent action was highlighted in an update which was published just last October. But however, despite the uncertainties, there's one message that most would agree on. It's that under business as usual scenarios, we can't rule out later in this century really catastrophic warming and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice cap. But even those who aren't deniers and agree that there's a significant risk of climate catastrophe a century hence, they still differ in how urgently they advocate action today. And it's important that these differences stem from differences in economics and in ethics. In particular, in how much obligation we should feel towards future generations. 
The assessment that economists make will depend on expectations of future growth and optimism about technological fixes. But above all, it depends on an ethical issue. In optimizing people's life chances, should we discriminate on grounds of date of birth? If we apply a standard discount rate, as we would if decided to put up an office building, then that gives zero weight to what happens after 2050. Whereas we ought to care about people born recently who will be alive at the end of a century. Politicians won't prioritize issues where the benefits accrue mainly to distant parts of the world and the decades into the future. They've got more urgent things on their radar unless there's public pressure, unless they know the public's behind them. But they do care about what's in the press and what's in their inboxes. That's why we should welcome public demonstrations. And of course, today's young people will be alive at the end of a century. We shouldn't discount their future. And this campaign to keep these issues in the forefront of politicians' minds depend on charismatic individuals. Two examples. The Pope produced an encyclical in the summer of 2015, and he has a billion followers in Latin America, Africa, and East Asia. And that was very important. He got him a standing ovation at the UN, and it eased the path to consensus at the Paris Climate Conference in December uh, of 2015. And a more parochial example, um, one politician here, Michael Gove, wouldn't have expended any of his rather meager economic or political capital um, on legislation against non-reusable drinking straws, etc., had it not been for the influence of our secular pope, as it were, David Attenborough, whose program Blue Planet uh, showed the pictures of, um, uh, in particular, the albatross returning to its nest and coughing up plastic debris rather than the longed-for food for its young in the nest. And that's an iconic picture uh, for the campaign on the world oceans, which wasn't high on the agenda until two years ago, just as the polar bear on the melting ice flow is iconic for climate campaigners. Incidentally, I'd note there is one policy context where we do apply a very low discount rate, essentially zero, and that's to radioactive waste disposal when the depositories are required to prevent leakage for 10,000 years or even a million years. And this is a bit ironic when we can't plan energy policy itself even 30 years ahead. There's one win-win roadmap, in my view, towards a low-carbon future. It's for nations to accelerate research and development into all forms of low-carbon energy generation and into other technologies where we need parallel progress, especially storage, batteries, compressed air, pumped storage, flywheels, etc., and smart grids. The faster these clean technologies advance, the sooner will their prices fall. So they become affordable to, for instance, India. And India needs more generating capacity. At the moment, the health of its poor is jeopardized by smoky stoves burning wood or dung. And there's pressure to build coal-fired power stations if they're the cheapest. But if you can accelerate R&D so the costs of and efficiency of clean energy comes down, then they can leapfrog directly to it, just as they've leapfrogged directly to mobile phones and never had landlines. And incidentally, another thing we'll need is because of local intermittency in uh, uh, wind and solar energy, we will need massive storage and continental scale DC grids carrying solar energy from the sunny south of Europe uh, to the north and also east-west to smooth over peak demand in different time zones. Here, ideally, all the way along the Belt and Road from here to China. And despite some ambivalence about nuclear energy, I think it's worthwhile to at least boost R&D 
into a variety of fourth generation concepts, which could prove more flexible in size and safer. And the potential for, for fusion is so great, it's surely worth continuing experiments and prototypes. And this scenario is in particular a specially attractive option for this country. Because implementing our Climate Change Act will cut global emissions by not much more than 1%. But we produce about 10% of the world's best scientific ideas. So through having a blitz on innovation, prioritizing clean energy research as much as defense research or medical research, we can aspire to make a much more than 2% difference to the world's CO2 emissions. And of course, try economic benefit. It would be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than devising clean and cheap energy systems for the entire world. Having mentioned engineers, incidentally, I'd like to um, digress and enter a note of modesty. The published some engineers here today, and uh, I'm just an armchair theorist. And my engineering friends rather like an old cartoon which shows two beavers looking up at a big hydroelectric dam. One beaver says to the other, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. And this, in fact, really represents the balance of uh, effort and brain power between those of us who have the ideas um, and people who actually make things that people need and which work. So it's the engineers who face the bigger challenge. And I tell my theoretical colleagues that the Swedish engineer who invented the zip fastener made a bigger intellectual leap than most of them ever will in their lifetime. But if the attempts to cut CO2 emission don't succeed worldwide, or if it turns out that the temperature is rising faster uh, than current predictions, then there will be a temptation to adopt a different plan, so-called geoengineering. And the most popular idea is to reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the ground level by putting aerosols in the upper atmosphere or mirrors in space or something like that. Well, this is possible, indeed, it's frighteningly cheap. But there's a risk in it because um, it could be done by a single nation, but of course different nations would want to turn down the thermostat differently. And um, there'd be opportunities for all kinds of litigation. The only winners would be the lawyers, because if you can litigate uh, about bad weather, this is a big bonanza for them. But we want to avoid that. There is, though, a second kind of geoengineering, which is more benign. That's the lower one here, which is to directly extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In other words, to undo the geoengineering we've unwittingly done by burning the fossil fuels. Um, this uh, is uh, very expensive energy-wise, um, but uh, um, it may be something worth doing eventually. Well, we should be evangelists for new technology, not Luddites. Without it, the world can't provide enough food nor sustainable energy for an expanding and more demanding population. But there is a dark side, which I also address in my book. Many of us are anxious that some technologies are advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with them and that we'll have a bumpy ride through this century. We're ever more dependent on elaborate networks, electric power grids, air traffic control, international finance, just-in-time delivery, and so forth. Unless these globalized networks are highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic albeit rare breakdowns, real-world analogues of what happened in 2008 to the financial system. Our cities will be paralyzed without electricity, supermarket shelves empty within days if supply chains were disrupted, air travel could spread a pandemic worldwide within days, and social media can spread panic and rumor, and psychic and economic contagion literally at the speed of light. And indeed, 
Society is fragile to a breakdown of order and is far more um, uh, um, brittle now than it was when we were more self-sufficient locally. Advances in microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines, and antibiotics offer prospects of containing pandemics, but the same research has controversial aspects. For instance, in 2011, two groups, one in Wisconsin, the other in Holland, showed it was surprisingly easy to make the flu virus both more virulent and more transmissible. To some, this was a scary portent of things to come, and the US federal government stopped funding these so-called gain-of-function experiments. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 techniques for gene editing are also hugely promising, but they raise ethical concerns. In particular, you recall the recent Chinese experiments on human embryos. And also, uh, there's a concern about possible runaway consequences of gene drive programs where you can make a particular species sterile. This may be okay if you wipe out the kind of mosquito that carries the Zika virus, but if uh, you wanted to wipe out the uh, gray squirrel to give a better chance to the brown squirrel, you might trigger in, uh, other changes in the ecology that will run out of control. So we have to be careful. So for biotech, regulation is clearly needed. But I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential or ethical grounds can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws or the tax laws can. Whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that's a nightmare. Whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without big special purpose facilities, biotech involves small-scale dual-use equipment. Indeed, biohacking is burgeoning even as a hobby and competitive game. We know all too well that technical expertise doesn't guarantee balanced rationality. The global village will have its village idiots, but they now have global range. And the rising empowerment of tech-savvy groups by bio as well as cyber technology will pose an intractable challenge to governance and aggravate the tension between freedom, privacy, and security. And these concerns are fairly near term, within 10 or 15 years. What about 2050 and beyond? On the bio front, we may then expect two things. First, a better understanding of the combination of genes which determine key human characteristics, intelligence, looks, etc., and the ability to synthesize genomes to match these features. That the great physicist Freeman Dyson conjectures the time when children will be able to design and create new organisms, just as routinely as his generation played with chemistry sets. Well, if it really became possible to, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, then our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. So let's hope that stays science fiction. And what about another transformative technology? Robotics and artificial intelligence, AI. There's been exciting advances in generalized machine learning. You've probably all heard about DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero computer, which famously achieved world championship level in the games of Go and chess in just a few hours. It was given just the rules and learned by playing against itself over and over again. Its processing speed allowed it to complete several games every second. But the human challenger, here he is, had some advantages. The computer used hundreds of kilowatts of power. He uses about 30 watts, no more than a light bulb in our brain, and can do lots of other things apart from just playing a game. But already AI can cope better than humans with complex, fast-changing networks. Traffic flow, electric grids, for instance could enable the Chinese to gather and process all the information needed to run an efficient planned economy of a kind that Marx could only dream of. And in science, its capacity to explore zillions of options could allow us to discover recipes for better drugs or a material that conducts electricity with zero resistance at room temperature. It's, of course, the speed of computers 
which allows them to succeed by brute force methods. They learn to identify dogs, cats, and human faces by crunching through millions of images, not the way babies learn. They learn to translate by reading millions of pages of multilingual text. For instance, EU documents. Their boredom threshold is infinite. The implications for our society of all this are already ambivalent. If we're sentenced to a term in prison, recommended for surgery, or even given a poor credit rating, we'd expect the reasons to be accessible to us and contestable by us. If such decisions were entirely delegated to an algorithm, we'd be entitled to feel uneasy, even if presented with compelling evidence that on average, the machines make better decisions than the humans they've usurped. AI systems will become more intrusive and pervasive. Records of our movements, our health, and our financial transactions will be in the cloud, managed by a multinational quasi-monopoly. The data may be used for benign purposes, for instance, medical research, but its availability to internet companies is already shifting the balance of power from governments to uh, globe-spanning conglomerates. Many experts, therefore, think that AI, like synthetic biology, already needs guidelines for responsible innovation. Tensions are already emerging when AI, for instance, what DeepMind is doing, move from the research phase to being a potentially massive money spinner for global companies. But some other experts, like the roboticist Rodney Brooks, who's the creator of the Baxter robot and the Roomba vacuum cleaner, he thinks there'll be many decades before we need to be more concerned about artificial intelligence than about uh, real stupidity. Machines are still clumsy compared to children in sensing and interacting with the real world. But they're improving. This Boston Dynamics robot can turn somersaults, though not very elegantly. And the incipient shift in the nature of work, they've been addressed in several excellent books by economists and social scientists. Clearly, machines will take over much of manufacturing and retail distribution. And they can supplement, if not replace, many white-collar jobs. Routine legal work, accountancy, computer coding, medical diagnostics, even surgery. So many professionals will find their hard-earned skills in less demand. In contrast, some skilled service sector jobs, plumbing and gardening, for instance, require such non-routine interactions with the external world that they'd be among the hardest jobs to automate. And incidentally, I think driverless cars are further in, in the future than some zealots believe. The digital revolution will generate huge wealth for innovators and global companies, but preserving a healthy society will surely require redistribution of that wealth. And there's talk of a universal income, but it's better when all who are able to do work can perform socially useful work. And indeed, I think that to create a humane society, governments will need to vastly enhance the number and status of those who, for instance, care for the old, the young, and the sick. There are currently far too few of these. They're poorly paid, inadequately esteemed, and insecure. Their work is far more fulfilling than the mind-numbing work in call centers or Amazon warehouses, and so if th those jobs can be uh, replaced by those where the human element is crucial, that is also win-win. I can see this happening in China or Scandinavia, uh, though I fear there might be ideological barriers in countries that fetishize low tax rates. And there will be other privacy concerns, of course. Um, are you happy if a stranger can, by facial recognition, identify you and invade your privacy, or if fake videos become so convincing that visual evidence can no longer be trusted. Well, the problem is, can robots, however advanced they are, can they learn common sense and ethics? They succeed by reinforced learning on big training sets. But learning about human behavior involves observing real people in real homes or workplaces. And the machine would feel centrally deprived 
by the slowness of real life. It's like watching trees grow is for us. And to quote Lee Stuart Russell, who's a leading AI theorist, he says, it could try all kinds of things, scrambling eggs, stacking wooden blocks, chewing wires, poking its finger into electric outlets. But nothing will produce a strong enough feedback loop to convince the computer it was on the right track and lead to the next necessary action. And so this is still uh, a challenge. But let's look still further ahead. What if a machine developed a mind of its own? Would it stay docile or would it go rogue? Popular culture portrays a dark side, of course, when AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the Internet of Things, and pursues goals misaligned with human interests, or even treats humans as an encumbrance. But be it as it may, it's likely that the society will be transformed by autonomous robots, even though the jury's out on whether they'll be an idiot savant or display superhuman capabilities. The futurologist Ray Kurzweil, who now works at Google, he argues that once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones, an intelligence explosion. He wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines, where he predicted that humans would transcend biology by merging with computers. In old-style spiritual parlance, they would go over to the other side. We then confront the classic philosophical problem of personal identity. Could your brain be downloaded into a machine? If so, in what sense would it still be you? Should you be relaxed about your original body, then being destroyed? What would happen if several clones were made of you? These are ancient conundrums for philosophers, but practical ethicists may need to address them later in the century. But Kurzweil is worried that this nirvana may not happen in his lifetime. So he wants his body frozen in liquid nitrogen until it's reached. And there's a company in Arizona that will freeze and store your body so that when your mortality is on offer, you can be resurrected or your brain downloaded. I was surprised to find that three academics here in England had gone in for this so-called cryonics. Two had paid the full whack, about $80,000, and the third took the cut price option of wanting just his head frozen. And I was glad that they were all from Oxford, not from my university. And I told them I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than an American refrigerator. But more seriously, of course, research on aging is being prioritized. But will the benefits be incremental, or is aging a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would plainly be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. But it may happen along with human enhancement in other forms. But it's at least surely on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique, may become malleable through the deployment of genetic modifications, either or cyborg modifications. Moreover, this future evolution, a kind of secular intelligent design, would take only centuries, maybe even less, in contrast to the thousands of centuries needed for each stage in Darwinian evolution. And this is a game changer. When we admire the literature and artifacts which have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across a time gulf of thousands of years with those ancient artists and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligences a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us, even though they may have some algorithmic understanding of how we behaved. And now I turn to another technology, space. 
because it's beyond our Earth in environments hostile to humans that cyborg and AI technologies have the most spectacular scope and where these changes will happen fastest and where I think they should worry us less. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by swarms of miniaturized probes, far more advanced than the wonderful Cassini probe designed in the 1990s, which spent 13 years orbiting around Saturn and its moons, or the robot that the Europeans built and sent to this, this uh, comet um, and uh, landed a little robot on it, or the NASA probe that transmitted amazing pictures from Pluto, 20,000 times further away than the moon. Think of the computers and phones of the 1990s when these three probes were designed. Realize how much better we can do today. So the next step will be deployment in space of robotic fabricators which can build large structures. For instance, giant telescopes with huge gossamer thin mirrors assembled under zero gravity and huge solar energy collectors. But what about manned spaceflight? Here, I'd argue that the practical case gets ever weaker with each advance in robotics and miniaturization. So will it have a resurgence? It's 50 years since Neil Armstrong's one small step on the moon. And I cherish this picture signed for me a few years ago by seven surviving Apollo astronauts. In the 1960s, of course, there was a space race against the Russians. NASA then got up to 4% of the American federal budget. Had that pace continued, there would, as many of us expected then, have been footprints on Mars long before today. But once the race to the moon was won, there was no motivation for the Americans continuing this huge expenditure. NASA now gets about 0.5% of the budget rather than up to four. Hundreds more have ventured into space subsequently, but anticlimactically they've done no more than circle the Earth in low orbit, mainly in the International Space Station here. And these people only make news when something goes wrong. When the loo fails, for instance, or when they perform stunts like the uh, Canadian Chris Hadfield singing David Bowie and playing his guitar. But will there be any inspirational Apollo-style projects involving people? There's no denying that NASA's Curiosity probe, fronting across a giant Martian crater, you can see about a quarter of the way up, you can see it's track marks, it's been about 30 miles so far, it may miss startling discoveries that no human geologist could overlook. But machine learning is advancing fast, as is sensor technology. In contrast, the cost gap between manned and unmanned missions remains huge. NASA's manned program, ever since Apollo, has been impeded by public and political pressure into being very risk-averse and therefore very expensive. The Space Shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Astronauts or test pilots would willingly accept this less than 2% level of risk, but the shuttle had been unwisely promoted as safe for civilians, so each failure caused a national trauma and a big delay with attempts to reduce the risk still further. And because of this safety culture, NASA will confront political obstacles in achieving any grand goal within a feasible budget, as of course with ESA as well. China has the resources, the Dirigis government, and maybe the willingness to undertake an Apollo-style program. If it wanted to assert its superpower status, it couldn't just redo what the Americans did 50 years earlier. A clear-cut great leap forward would involve footprints on Mars, not just on the moon. But leaving aside the Chinese, I think the future of manned spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit lies with privately funded adventurers prepared to participate in a cut-price program far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly supported civilians. Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin 
will soon offer orbital flights to paying customers. And were I an American, I would only support NASA's unmanned program. I'd argue that private enterprise ventures, bringing a Silicon Valley culture into a domain long dominated by NASA and a few aerospace conglomerates, should front all manned missions as cut price, high risk ventures. There'd still be many volunteers, some perhaps even accepting one way tickets, driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers, and the like. The phrase space tourism should be avoided because it lulls people into believing that such ventures are routine and low risk. And if that's the perception, the inevitable accidents will be as traumatic as those of the space shuttle were. These exploits must be sold as dangerous sports or intrepid exploration. But by 2100, courageous thrill seekers, people in the mold of a latter day Savannah or Fines, people like that, may have established bases on Mars. Musk himself says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. Good luck to them all. But don't ever expect mass emigration from Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. Here I disagree with Musk and with my late colleague Stephen Hawking. I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from Earth's problems. Dealing with climate change here on Earth may be hard, but it's a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. Nonetheless, we should cheer on these brave space adventurers. And that's because they'll have a pivotal role in spearheading the post-human future and determine what happens in the 22nd century and far beyond. And this is why they'll be ill-adapted to their Martian habitat. So they'll have a more compelling incentive than those of us here on Earth to redesign themselves. They'll harness a super powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed later this century. These techniques will, we hope, be restrained here on Earth on prudential and ethical grounds. But those on Mars will be beyond the clutches of the regulators. And we should surely wish them good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to hostile environments. So it's these spacefaring adventurers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead a kind of post-human era. Maybe flesh and blood, more likely perhaps eventually completely electronic. This raises the question astronomers are most often asked. Is there life out there already? Or is the galaxy waiting for our remote progeny? Well, we know there's no way in our solar system that harbors advanced life, but what about simple life? There may be freeze-dried bacteria on the red planet, Mars. There may be creatures swimming under the ice of Saturn's moon Enceladus. But let's widen our horizon to the realm of the stars. Because we've excitedly learned that most stars in the sky are orbited by retinues of planets, like the sun is. Far too remote for a probe to go to now, of course. And the evidence is mainly indirect. We don't observe the planets, but we detect its influence on the motion or brightness of the star it's orbiting. This is a very exciting field, and my Cambridge colleague Didier Kellos got a Nobel Prize just this week for being a pioneer uh, and leader in planet finding. One technique is this. If you look at a star, then its brightness will dim if a planet moves across in front of it. And by looking for the dip, you can estimate how big the planet is, and by seeing the recurrence time, you can estimate the length of that planet's year. And this is a way in which many, many planets have been uh, inferred. NASA's Kepler mission looked for three or four years at an area of sky about seven degrees across and me measured the brightness of 150,000 stars with very high precision once every hour. And it found many uh, solar systems. And 
uh, this, this rather silly picture um, illustrates um, um, some of these systems where um, this is scaled to give the length of their year um, and, uh, and the size of the planets. But there are now about 4,000 extrasolar planets which have been known. And what we can conclude is that almost every star has a planet, a planet around it of some kind, and one in every six stars has an Earth-like planet. And by an Earth-like planet, um, I mean one which is about the size of the Earth and a, a distance from its parent star such that liquid water can exist. And here's a remarkable system which was found. Um, uh, this is um, a miniature solar system. The star is about 1% as bright as the, uh, as the Sun, it's an M dwarf, and it's got seven planets orbiting it. The nearest one has a year of only a di one and a half Earth days, the uh, outer one uh, 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 has 18 days. And the outer three of these are in the habitable zone, because the star is so faint. But they'd be very unearthly, this is an artist impression, we don't know what they're like at all. They're probably incidentally tidally locked, so they present the same face to their star. One hemisphere in perpetual light, the other in, in darkness, just as the moon always presents the same face to the Earth. If the life on there, then everyone would be in the light half, except the astronomers segregated on the dark side, far away. Well, can we actually get a, a picture of these remote Earth-like planets? That's hard. To realize how hard, let's suppose some alien astronomers with a powerful telescope were viewing our Earth from, say, 30 light years away, the distance of a nearby star. In Carl Sagan's nice phrase, the Earth would look a pale blue dot, very close to a star, our sun, that outshines it by many billions, a far-fly Lexo searchlight. But the aliens could learn something. The shade of blue would be slightly different, depending on where the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Eurasia was facing them. So the alien astronomers could infer the length of our day, the seasons, the gross topography, and by analyzing the light, something with its climate. And perhaps that it had a biosphere. Lots of green stuff and chlorophyll. Well, our telescopes aren't yet big enough to collect enough light from these faint objects, but within 10 years, this telescope, being built by European astronomers, um, they're not very imaginative in the nomenclature, it's called the Extremely Large Telescope, and it has a mirror which is uh, 39 meters across, which is probably about the size of this uh, auditorium. And such instruments will be able to detect enough light to draw inferences like those I sketched for Earth-like planets near, uh, around nearby stars. And find that some are habitable or maybe have some sort of life. But we don't know how likely that is. We don't know how life began on Earth and whether it's a rare fluke or common. But, of course, what people really want to know is not just about life, but around, uh, about intelligent life. And here, we can't be at all confident. But I think SETI searches are worthwhile, even though the chance of success is small. That's really a topic of a different lecture, but uh, let me just say we have no idea. Um, although I would like to add, that there are some people who think they know the answer about alien life. I get letters from people who say they've been abducted or they've uh, uh, been visited um, by aliens, etc. And uh, I write back to these people saying, do they really think that if the aliens had made a huge tactical effort to traverse interstellar space, would they just meet one or two well-known cranks, maybe make a corn circle and go away again? Seems unlikely to me. And I tell these people to uh, write to each other and not right to me. <laughs> well, let's now think about much longer time scales. This is a familiar time chart showing the four billion years of evolution on Earth. And if we think of future evolution, 
As I said, this will be second in terms of design. Even the cautious amongst us think it will happen much faster than Darwinian evolution. Certainly, the timescale for this advance in the future will be but an instant compared to the timescale for the Darwinian selection that's led to us. So the outcome of future evolution could surpass humans by as much as we intellectually surpass slime mold, for instance. The sun's been shining for four and a half billion years. It's got six billion years more before the fuel runs out. And the expanding universe will continue, perhaps forever. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So we may not even be at the halfway stage of evolution. So even if life had originated only on the Earth, it need not remain a trivial feature of the cosmos. Humans could jumpstart a diaspora whereby ever more complex intelligences spread through the whole galaxy. So even if we discovered a manifestly artificial emission in SETI, it may be something which is, as it were, a billion years ahead of us. Uh, rather than something like a flesh and blood civilization. It would more likely represent a byproduct, even a malfunction, of some super complex interstellar technology, which could trace its lineage back to alien organic beings, um, but uh, uh, very different. So I think we should look for artifacts, but not expect them to be uh, anything like our civilization um, or sending us any messages. Let's now widen our horizon to the entire cosmos. We could eventually be within range of humans or post-humans or their alien counterparts. The death of stars would be no impediment to them, nor the merger of galaxies. And, and our galaxy here and Andromeda in four billion years are going to merge together, as shown here. This merged remnant will persist for 100 billion years. Time enough, perhaps, to approach the peak intelligence limit, when all the atoms once in stars could be transformed into some vast structure as intricate as a living organism or a silicon chip. But even so, some parts of space-time would still be unreachable. This is a picture which shows very distant galaxies, billions of light years away, but there's a limit to how far we can see, a limit set by the horizon, uh, which limits how far light can travel to the Big Bang. So the observable universe is only a fraction of the aftermath of our Big Bang. We expect far more galaxies located irreverse, unobservably beyond our horizon. So the aftermath of our Big Bang is even greater than the region we can see with our biggest telescopes. We have a horizon, but that horizon has no physical reality any more than the horizon around you in the middle of the ocean. And most astronomers think that this extends much further, but that's a minimum. If it's extended far enough, then all combinatorial possibilities would be repeated. Far beyond the horizon, we could all have avatars. But that's not all. Our Big Bang may not be the only one. It could be just one island in a vast cosmic archipelago. The Russian cosmologist Andrei Lin's eternal inflation model is an example of this. These multiverses are still speculative physics because we don't have a battle-tested theory which describes the very beginning of our Big Bang. And indeed, a challenge for 21st century physics is to address two fundamental questions illustrated in this decision tree. First, are there many Big Bangs, or just one? Second, if there are many, are they all governed by the same physics? Or could other Big Bangs have cooled down differently, ending up with different geometry, different particles, different forces, and so forth? If the latter is true, many of these cosmoses could be stillborn or sterile. The laws prevailing in them might not allow any kind of complexity. We therefore wouldn't expect to find ourselves in a typical universe. Rather, we'd be in a subset where an observer could evolve. This is what's called anthropic selection. So just as Earth may be a rather special planet 
among zillions of others. So on a far grander scale, our Big Bang may have been a special one. In this hugely expanded cosmic perspective, what we call universal laws could be mere parochial bylaws governing our cosmic patch. Some physicists sort of foam at their mouth at this idea of the multiverse, but our prefaces are relevant to the way physical reality actually is, and we should surely be open-minded. Space and time on the grandest scale could have a structure as intricate as a rich ecosystem. Our current concept of physical reality could be constricted as the perspective of the Earth available to a plankton whose universe is a spoonful of water. About 10 years ago, I was on a panel at Stanford University where we were asked, on the scale, would you bet your goldfish, your dog, or your life, what would you bet on a multiverse? I said that I was nearly at the dog level. And Elinde, who'd spent 25 years promoting his eternal inflation, said he'd almost bet his life. And later on being told this, Steven Weinberg said he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. Well, Andre Linde, my dog and I will all be dead before this is settled, but it's not metaphysics. It's highly speculative and exciting science, and it may be true. But just in my final one minute, I'd like to zoom in from the universe, or even an ensemble of universes, to the realities here and now. Even in the context of a concertinaed timeline extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has a planet's future in our hand. When we could jumpstart the transitions from an Earth based to a spacefaring species and from biological to artificial intelligence, and those transitions could inaugurate billions of years of post-human evolution, even more marvelous than what's led to us. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, cyber, or environmental catastrophes, which foreclose these possibilities. So our Earth, this pale blue dot in the cosmos, is a special place. It may be a unique place, and we're its stewards at a specially crucial era. And that's an important message for us all, whether or not we're astronomers. Thank you for listening.